Welcome to the Painting Lines Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things tennis. Join Eric and Aiden in their discussion for updates on news and pop culture, and from hot takes to betting, they've got you covered. Ready? Play. Hey guys, welcome back to Painting Lines. We have officially entered the clay court season, and in honor of Francis Tiafo, aka the Big Foes title down in Houston, we decided to do this episode on an American tennis player spotlight, past, present, and future. So without further ado, let's jump on in. Yeah, I mean, looking at American tennis is pretty interesting because for a long time, especially in like the 70s through the 90s and even the early 2000s, Americans were pretty dominant. If you look at people like Sampras, Agassi, McEnroe, these guys are all like greats of the game. And after them, there's really nobody that carried the baton forward. Mm -hmm. Like obviously you have Sampras with his 14 slams, the most of all time when he retired. So a pretty good argument to be the greatest of all time at the time of his retirement. Mm -hmm. He was kind of the epitome of like the serve and volley style. He was as good at it as you could hope to be. But he also had like a really solid baseline game, which is why he was such a dominant player because he didn't have to rely on the serve and volley to beat people. Yeah, no, when I think of American tennis and the dominance, you're right. Names like Sampras, Agassi, Connors, McEnroe, they all pop up into my head. And then you kind of get to those dark ages of American tennis where there, like you said, there really wasn't someone to pass the baton to. So I'm hoping that we've kind of come out of that right now. You know, we have a pretty big presence within the top 30. I don't see any Americans coming close to Sampras's 14 slams or even Agassi's eight. Uh, what do you think? I, I agree completely. I mean, it really seems like there's other guys that are at the top right now. Medvedev, Alcaraz, those guys seem like they're going to be dominating for a while. And I think we may see an American breakthrough here or there, maybe win one, maybe win two. But the likelihood that these guys become super dominant doesn't seem that high. It seems like these guys are going to be high level players that if they get the opportunity may win a slam. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to see some within American players rivalry like we had in Agassi and Sampras, right? Like. Who do you think could fill that void where we see two Americans battling it out? The only guys I can think of that sort of have a rivalry at this point are just Tommy Paul and Taylor Fritz have been competing against each other for a long time. I mean, they played in junior Grand Slam finals against each other. Wow. So it's going to continue, but I think the issue is they don't have that much media beef in a way. Agassi talked about in his book, he didn't really dislike Sampras. He just felt like he was always playing him and mm. the media sort of pitted them against each other. I don't see the media pitting Tommy Paul and Taylor Fritz against each other. I don't see that either just because they're simply not as good. There's really no media hype around it. Whereas Agassi and Sampras, yeah, it kind of felt like they were meeting each other in every other Grand Slam final. And Sampras's dominance over Agassi was kind of it was a nice story for the american public it was something for people to look forward to but no i um i don't see it anywhere anywhere near that i think another reason they had such a great thing in the media was because their playing styles contrasted so much mm -hmm. like sampras was as we said the epitome of the servant volley and agassi was the perfect return player like right. he was so good at returning the ball and that made it so that it was exciting to see them play because it wasn't like two great servers or two great returners. You were seeing the best server in the world play against the best returner in the world. I think also their personalities, like Agassi had that kind of flair. He had the crazy hair for a long time. He wore the jean shorts. Sampras was sort of the more calm. He was like the California guy, just super calm and more composed. It's kind of what you had with Nadal versus Federer, sort of the fire in the ice. And that's what everybody wants to see in a rivalry. And with American tennis right now, it just doesn't really exist. Yeah, you hit that right on the head. You know, I, I think there does need to be more personality 
with the American tennis players too, in order to get more viewers into it. Do you remember in the book when talking about the jean shorts, when McEnroe had first dibs on the Nike clothes and he holds up the jean shorts and acts, he's like, please don't take them. Please don't take them. And he goes, what the fuck are these? Yeah. He's like, who would take these? <laughs> and then I see, yeah, sure enough. Yeah. Now that I was mean, fun. McEnroe though, is, it's interesting that because McEnroe kind of was the fiery guy in his rivalry mm. with Born, Bjorn Borg. Yeah. Because Bjorn Borg was like the, the Swede. He was like the really handsome dude that all the girls loved. And McEnroe was just like the crazy guy that was yelling at the ref. Yeah. But even then, even then, even though it wasn't two Americans, it was one American that was at the top of the sport and he was bringing a lot of personality to it, bringing popularity to the sport. The only guy I can think of that has any sort of like fire right now really is like Tiafo. Mm -hmm. No, I know. I know. I mean, I know Kyrgios is an American, but he brings that back into the sport. I think we need to see more of him. I really wish he played clay season. Yeah, I agree completely. He he has brought a lot of popularity to the sport, not only because he's a uh, exciting tennis player, but he interacts on like social media and other other forms of media, kind of bringing popularity like to tennis. Like he's a cool tennis player is how people right. see him. Mm -hmm. Versus how a lot of people view tennis players is sort of oh like. People see, a, think of a tennis player, I think, a lot of the time as like a guy in his 60s playing at his local country club. Yeah. And that's, no, sort of the, that's sort of the image you don't want for a, a sport that's trying to grow and become more popular. I know. I'm hoping Point Break does does good for the, the, the sport. Yeah, that, the, I mean... The Netflix doc. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it can, it can bring in new viewers. I don't know how many people, though, that are going to watch that if they weren't already into tennis is the issue Fair. all right let's talk Roddick now he was supposed to be the guy he was supposed to get the torch from Sampras um, you know win multiple grand slams probably even double digits if it wasn't for you know who from Switzerland but yeah no I mean he he kind of embodied that American spirit too like he kind of had that personality that like punk rock attitude with the spiky hair like sideway visors baggy clothes uh wicked serve have you ever seen him serve oh yeah it's he it's rips it wild yeah 140 miles an hour but yeah in, in the the kind of funny thing about that too is it would have been a great rivalry it could have been the next uh McEnroe versus Bjor versus Borg if mm -hmm. he had been able to actually compete with Federer the issue is that Federer was just too good. Yeah. Like it was a it would have been a rivalry if Roddick won more. But so then he just got beaten too much. Yeah, it's that's not that's not a rivalry. Exactly. Uh-huh. All right. And then now, what about other Americans? You know, Marty Fish. He used to live with Roddick. Roddick's parents basically raised Marty Fish. He was, you know, he had Grand Slam potential. Nothing really ever came out of it. I know he had some mental health issues and uh, he was battling his own demons. But other than that, I don't see really, you know, he broke into the top 10. I think he even might've been, yeah, number 14 at one point, but uh, not quite top 10, but top 20. I don't see anyone else in that, you know, early 2000s to even like 20. Probably 20? like 20, 2011, maybe. I think that like Isner probably, Isner was probably in the top 20 in, in like 2012 or 13. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as we said in our serve and volley episode, it's, you got to do more. Can't yeah. win. Can't I win mean, like serve and volley. M Marty Fish, I mean, he never really was able to break through at slams is the big thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, I believe he only got like to the quarterfinals at some of the slams. His, his, his really big thing, I think, that is probably his career accomplishment is that he won the silver medal at the Athens Games in 2004. But still, I mean, if he was supposed to be the next big guy, him and Roddick, it kind of just didn't pan out for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, and then we get into the next wave, the next generation kind of. Yeah, and the next generation I feel like is just defined by – I mean, you talked about how Roddick had a six serve, but mm -hmm. the next generation of guys – I feel like we're all serving volleyers. Like all the top Americans 
were just completely defined by the servant volley. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. people like Isner, he got all the way up to number eight. And he was in like the top 10 to 20 for a long time. But all he had was just this massive serve, which got him a good amount of titles. He got 16 titles with it. Yeah. But it can't it can't push you through. Like, like we were talking about with Sampras, he had a great baseline game mm-hmm. that allowed him to use the serve and volley effectively. Isner, his baseline game is a little bit weak, but it's covered up by the fact that his serve is so strong. Mm-hmm. And I do think that Roddick's, I guess, lack of um, like fulfillment almost kind of set the stage for mediocre, mediocre tennis play in the U.S. Because I feel like if there was, you know, someone like an Agassi, like a Sampras, um, who was good, then that would get the fans more into it, more young kids wanting to play tennis, more people training harder. But because of the fall off, I I just feel like that kind of set the stage for American tennis. Like it wasn't really any, it wasn't a force anymore. It wasn't something that um, Americans were that into because they simply didn't have anyone to watch or anyone that was doing well. Like you said, Isner was that guy for a little. He was top American, but he just wasn't anything close. Yeah, like I, I get pretty much guarantee that tennis grew significantly in switzerland serbia Mm -hmm. and even probably spain because of those like the big three yeah yeah so then all right we mentioned isner who else were some of the dark ages american tennis players you have guys like sam query who is retired now famous pickleballer now yeah he's, exactly i wouldn't say famous but pro yeah. pickleballer now have you seen those those matches with him and jack sock i've seen a couple yeah i just hate watching pickleball it's funny because they're they're always playing against like the top pickleballers in the world <laughs> and they're like yeah. tennis players and they're still yeah. like competing yeah but yeah he was a very similar guy to uh isner he had a big serve big forehand but he was a little small he was only six six and uh tiny never broke into the top 10 yeah tiny (laughs) never broke into the top 10 got to number 11 but still had 10 singles titles in his career so like nothing to be scoffed at like 10 singles titles is really impressive yeah he made a good living you know exactly and we have jack sock yeah jack sock a very cool player i mean he won the boys nationals in 2011 and got the wild card into the u.s open which is kind of a cool system i think uh, nice to, I think that is great for American tennis. Like you get the, the top junior players and they get into these big tournaments and they get that experience so that later along, if they go pro, they can, they have a little bit of experience and yeah. sock had a very interesting career because he obviously in 2011, I think he turned pro in 2011. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but he actually had really one massive year that brought him to number eight in the world. In 2017, he won three titles, including the Paris Masters, which is a super impressive feat, an ATP 1000 win. Yeah. But he's only won four singles titles in his career. Yeah. And three of them like came in that one year. He doesn't really have that winning attitude, though, like that killer mentality. I feel like a lot of the, his shots, like you've seen his forehand, you know, he, he ribs it, but... It's kind of lazy. It's either he hits a winner or he doesn't. Like he doesn't really stay in long rallies. He's um he kind of looks out of shape a lot of the time. I watch him. You know, he's always drenched in sweat. He's always kind of moping around the court. Um doesn't really know how to put bad points behind him. Like I feel like a lot of his match he's carrying, you know, uh previous previous baggage with him. So I I yeah, I don't think he's mentally strong enough to to take it to the next level. Um, he's still playing. I see him sometimes. Yeah, he's so hanging is, around. So there. is Isner as well. Yeah. yeah think, Isner was in a final not too long ago. Dallas. Yeah. And, and the thing about Jack Sock is actually, I think that attitude you're talking about and sort of the, the fact that he doesn't compete so hard for all these points, it, he, he, doesn't really use that to his advantage, but that style of play comes into the into the equation because he's actually a very strong doubles player. 
Oh, yeah. He's been ranked as high as number two in the world for doubles. Whoa. And he's won 17 doubles titles, including three Grand Slams and four master, Masters 1000s. So, like, in that sense, he uses that massive serve and just just the strong forehand, but he doesn't have to use that mobility. He doesn't have to get around the entire court. Yeah, that's a great point there. Uh, I didn't realize he was that good at doubles. Yeah, he won. Yeah, I guess points are way shorter. <laughs> yeah, he won uh, a few Grand Slams with uh, Mike Bryan, actually, of the oh. Bryan Bros. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he's actually won, I think, a couple Masters 1000, uh, including one last year with Isner, hmm. which is a sick combo to have. Like, you're pretty yeah. much guaranteed to win every single serve game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. So, huh. uh, yeah. And then the last guy from sort of the, the massive serve and volley era is Riley Opelka. I mean... He's he's much younger, but he's very similar. He's like an Isner 2.0 is the way I kind of describe him. Mm-hmm. And he has a career high of seven, number 17, but he's kind of fallen off a little bit recently. Yeah, I know. And What's he's got he's gotten four singles titles, but it's it's a thing where I think people probably figured him out. Mm-hmm. And that's that's an issue with him and I think a lot of guys if they are so dependent on the one strategy. Yeah, I feel like he's not playing too much anymore either. Like I don't really see his name in any of these uh these tournaments. Yeah, I I I agree. Yeah. But I do I think there are better days ahead. I think we're coming into kind of a return of of American strong American tennis. Yeah. I think we're for? coming I think we're going <laughs> I I guess um I don't want to say return to the point of before, but definitely better. Better days. Um you know, we have we have a good amount of Americans ranked uh, in the top 40. You know, we got Fritz, number 10, Tiafa number 11, Tommy Paul, number 18, Corda, 26, Sheldon, 39, Cressy, 40. Oh, that's decent, um, you know. Yeah, and I, I think people like, especially someone like Corda, is like kind of slept on. I mean, yeah. You, you, every, everyone, a lot of people talk about Fritz, Tiafo, and Tommy Paul because they're all top 20 players and they make big runs in tournaments. And people talk about Shelton because he's super young and mm-hmm. Cressy because he's a servant volleyer. But mm-hmm. I think Corda is being number 26 in the world is incredible. And it means that he's playing very solidly all, at all these tournaments, but he just needs to take it to that next level. But he is very young. He's only 22 mm-hmm. years old. So, yeah. And he's pretty injury prone. I know it's been keeping him out a lot, but I know he, uh, do you remember when he battled Djokovic in that final? Um, in Serbia, it was a, a tournament last year, but he had a few match points, and of course, Djokovic came out on top. Djokovic. And it was in that, Serbia too, so the he just had all Belgrade. Djokovic just has that dog, yeah, in him, bro. He does that wolf, but no, yeah. that was I think that was when Korda really could have broken out as a a legitimate player if he beats Djokovic in his home country yeah, for that a would final. Be insane. But, but yeah, I mean, I think, is, uh, what, what were you going to say? I mean, I, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, the next five years could be good. Mm-hmm. These guys are pretty young. All of yeah, these guys we just talked about are within or between 20 and 25. Wow. I like, I like that. I like the sound of that. But then again, you had, you know, other like Michael Chang, Sampras, um, McEnroe, like teenagers when they were winning slams. That's true. But, Michael but they Chang, also, youngest yeah. youngest Grand Slam winner ever. So yeah, there we go. It's at least he can claim that. This is only Grand Slam, granted. But I mean, yeah. that's hey, that's that's more than any of the Americans we're talking about now. True. So yeah, but yeah. What do you and think then, about the other countries in the the top yeah, rankings? Yeah, definitely. So I think Russia is kind of the force to be reckoned with right now because they have three players in the top twelve. You know, Medvedev, who's arguably one of the best players right now uh rublev who's not far behind and then kachanov you know those are three solid players i think i think they're all better than the americans right now and then um the third country that is like the most represented in the rankings is spain with five players in the top top 30 so yeah, um, I know. Yeah, Nadal's still there. Nadal's still up there. They got Davidovich Fokina, Crane Busta, 
Batista Goot. Batista Goot, yeah. Obviously he's... Alcaraz. How did I forget that? <laughs> he's but too yeah. far up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing about it is, like, you're looking at guys, like, like, we're optimistic for American tennis, but you look at people like Medvedev, Rublev, Alcaraz, all these guys that are in the top and they're super young still. I mean, mm-hmm. Medvedev isn't super young, but he's still young. Yeah. And, like, you have to think, maybe the Americans develop well, but so were these other guys. These other guys are still developing their talent as well. Mm-hmm. So if they keep grow at the same rate, are these Americans ever going to break through? Hard to say. It's hard to say. I think it just needs – we need one of them to break through, and then it'll kind of start a domino effect, right? Like, you know, you don't want to be – you want to be the first – guy in your country to win the slam you want to be the best in your country i think if one of them does it it's going to push the rest even harder to compete and i think that'll be good for the sport good for the sport in the u.s just overall good on for the tour you have um the thing about that is i you could make the same argument about andy murray sort of breaking through for britain like they hadn't won wimbledon in however many years and then he wins it twice actually but you didn't really see a next British guy like breaking through. Well, because you didn't have all the guys that we mentioned. We just said we had, you know, what, eight players, eight American players in the top 40. I don't think Britain ever had that. That's true, but yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, plus uh, Murray had to go against the big three. These guys don't. Just yeah. Djokovic. That's true. Which he'll be on his way out soon soon enough but he's been training this whole time when he skipped out on hardcore season or at I mean, least in skipped the US. out skipped out is uh <laughs> not necessarily the best way of putting it but we well, can say yeah. that yeah well this whole time he's been training on clay so he yeah. should be um he well, should I mean, hit the ground running i think he probably wants that third uh french open i mean having he's one of two guys i'm pretty sure him and nadal have both won all of the slams twice Mm-hmm. If he takes the French again, I think all of a sudden he'll have won all of them three times. Yeah, that's another reason to solidify him. Exactly. Hmm. All right. He, who who do you think the first American to win a Grand Slam will be? My argument, I think it's not coming this year for sure. No. I think maybe not even next year. And because of that, my argument is the first guy to break through is going to be Ben Shelton because I think he's at a high enough level and he's so young that by the time he hits his peak, maybe at like 25, maybe at 27, Mm -hmm. some of the guys that he's having to compete against right now are going to be past their prime and he's going to be in his prime and that's going to allow him to sort of break through and win a slam. All right. I could see that. I don't think he's going to be the first American. Um, I think he will win one for that exact reason you said, you know, give it like seven, eight years when he's in his prime. But I think Tommy Paul's going to get one in the next three years. And I hate to, I hate to discount him, but I think it's going to come in one of those tournaments when Djokovic either isn't playing or retired or, and then you had maybe an Alcaraz who for some reason is injured and is not in the tournament or maybe early exits. And then, maybe a surface like clay where Medvedev doesn't do well. I think it's going to take a lot of ifs and buts, but I think it's going to be Tommy Paul. So sort of like a, like a Dominic team 2020 U S open situation. Exactly. I think, you know, like everyone kind of discounts luck, but Hey, it takes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, 25 years from now, people are just going to see the team won the U S open in 2020. Right. No one's going to be like, Oh, Federer and Nadal didn't play, and Djokovic hit a yeah. lines person with a ball and got kicked <laughs> out of the tournament. Uh, speaking of Dominic Team winning that U.S. Open, do you think any of these Americans are going to win before Alexander Zverev? I mean, like I, I mean, my argument kind of doesn't really support that. But like, no, it, it kind of could because do you think Alexander Zverev will win a Slam before Shelton does in seven years? Because he's still young, he's what twenty four, twenty five. Well, I think Zverev? the question, I think the question there is like, do you think Zverev will win a slam? That is the question. Because I think he will. I think he has the ability that. Because I think at this point, if both players are playing at the peak of their game, 
I don't really see any of these Americans really beating a Medvedev or an Alcaraz. However, yeah. I think if they're both playing well, I could see a Zverev beating an Alcaraz or a Medvedev. Hmm. I like that Medvedev Zverev rivalry. I don't yeah. know. I think Alcaraz would kind of get the best of Zverev. But No, no, I think I think most on most days, yes, but I think I think if on a good day for for Zverev, mm -hmm. I could see him beating one of those guys. I think Medvedev or Alcaraz would have to have a, a bad day to yeah. lose to one yeah, of the yeah. Americans. To be well, honest. I just think Medvedev is going to be figured out. Like his strategy where he sits so far behind the baseline, it's only a matter of time until someone just, you know, rips it apart like Alcaraz did in that Miami final. Like I think other players can learn from watching that match every time they played Medvedev. Like he wasn't doing anything that spectacular. He was hitting drop shots that Medvedev wasn't able to get to, or if he was, just putting them away after. Like, there really wasn't anything too complex about that matchup and the strategy. That's a good point. Yeah, maybe maybe that's so, a, that's the strategy to beat Medvedev. Medvedev is beatable. But it's, I mean, he hits the ball so hard, it's hard to set up points that easily. Maybe mm -hmm. that's why, maybe that's why he's not as dominant on clay is because since it's slower, he can't see he, if he sits so far behind the baseline, he just gets drop shotted and people can set yeah. up a better strategy against him. Yeah, that's exactly. Remember, he was complaining about the slower court at Indian Wells and yeah. um, his backhand. He doesn't have that strong of a backhand to begin with. So when you put him on a slower court, it's just like he's teeing it up for people. Yeah, I mean, all of his shots look like it looks like he's <laughs> thinking so much. Like so, so many guys have like such a natural swing. But when you watch Medvedev, it looks like he's thinking about every single motion in the swing as he's setting it up. It doesn't look natural. <laughs> yeah, I know. Jeez. He kind of... Uh, have you seen Gasquet, his forehand? It's kind of like that same like big wind-up, like weird angle with it. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't like watching him. Yeah, I know what I you're talking it's about. it's awkward-looking shot. Exactly. But hey, back to Ben Shelton. So... It's pretty funny. Tennis TV posted on Instagram. Uh, clay court season's here. Check out all the new outfits. And, you know, they posted some Nike, Adidas, Lacoste. And then Ben Shelton was not featured in it. And he actually commented on the post and tagged his sponsor on cloud and said, no love. And then Tennis TV responded with like one of those uh, like shushing emojis too. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> That's like... <laughs> no respect so he's, for yeah, he's got the personality you know i think that's what we need yeah someone who's you know i don't see casper rude doing that yeah i feel like casper rude would be like just sitting like in his room on his phone like oh damn they didn't yeah. feature me <laughs> <laughs> we're playing golf yeah something like that <laughs> yeah all right you ready, ready to jump into segments yeah let's do it so what is new in tennis this week the big thing that I saw is that Murray said that he might skip the rest of the clay court season after losing to Diminar in the Monte Carlo Masters first round. Yeah, that was uh, embarrassing. Yeah, I mean, he got beaten soundly. He did. And so the question is, is it worth it for him? I mean, maybe not. It's a situation where he's getting older. He has to decide what tournaments he wants to play in and – if that tournament is going to be a good decision for him. Yeah. No, I, I like that. I like this move on his part. He looked slow out there and um, yeah, he has no business kind of wasting any juice that he has left right now. He's, yeah. And he's, I, I, I think it's, serve. it's very similar to what Federer did at the end of his career. You saw him actually skip the clay court season, I think a couple times. Mm -hmm. And I think it brought him more success in the end. Yeah, I think it's smart. Yeah, I think I if think... it gets him one more Wimbledon or two more Wimbledons, then uh, yeah, really benefit. I think it was really beneficial to Federer, and so it could be, be very beneficial for Murray as well. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was watching the Djokovic press conference down at Monte Carlo, and he was quoted saying that Alcaraz, Sinner, and Runa could be the next big three, which it's, it's out of context. It sounds like. Uh, 
like he's saying it seriously but when he said it you know he kind of said it with like that little joking like half smile that he does where he's kind of like oh yeah like the fan the fans love and the press love to just ask him about the big three and then the next phase of the big three so i feel like he was kind of just giving them you know a half-hearted answer where he's giving them something to chew on um i don't seriously think he means it do you no, I, I mean, I bet five years ago he said Team Zverev and Sitsipas were going to be the next big three. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. you could probably look up an article where he said something like that. And I think the three people he picked, I mean, I don't see, I haven't seen Rune really win anything that big. No. Uh, he's he's still young, though. He, he'll he, win. He is. He, he And he will. I think he will be uh -huh. a good player, but... I just where's, don't like his personality. Where's Medvedev in that equation? Yeah, well, notice these guys are pretty young. They're a lot younger than Medvedev. Well, relative, relatively yeah. in the tennis world, you know. But, yeah, I think that's kind of an insult to Medvedev. I think Medvedev should take that as, you know, a chip on his shoulder and come out there, hopefully play better. Because sure. I'd like to see Medvedev, you know, win a couple more slams. Yeah, I... I Ever since that interview that we've talked about in the past where he mm -hmm. uh, kind of went in on the fans and was like, why do you disrespect me so much? Yeah. I kind of have been on his side, so yeah, I'm rooting for him to win a couple. All right. Well, speaking of someone who needs to win, my bet of the week, Sitsipas, plus 600 to win Monte Carlo. I think he'll do it. I mean... I think that's a bold. It's bet. a reach. It's a reach, but especially I like it. because we just talked about how Djokovic has been training this entire time, and Sitsipas, like we talked about in uh, Miami, was like, "Oh, I'm injured. I'm not going to go far in this tournament." So I think, I think that's a very bold bet to take. I mean, big payoff, obviously, but yeah, pretty bold. Pretty bold. Who do you have? I have a matchup for tomorrow, Bautista Agut versus Verev. I think it's going to go over two and a half sets for a plus 155 underdog. All right. You don't think Zverev can close him out? To me, I think I think it's a uh, situation. Zverev already went three sets in his first matchup. And I think Bautista Agut is a very underrated player. I mean, he's the guy, ironically, I believe it was either him or Kareno Busta. But... I believe he was the guy that Djokovic was playing against in that U.S. Open when he hit the ball at the uh, referee. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, it was. <laughs> and he, it, he, Djokovic did that because he lost the first set to him. I mean, Bautista Agut is a top-level player. He just isn't able to break through into that top 10 level. Mm. But I think, I think he will lose. I think Zverev... Gets the win, but I think it at least goes to that third set. Yeah, I like that bet. Maybe I'll uh, I'll put some money on that too. Sounds All right, good. match of the week. So, did you see the Hercotch Jer match? Uh, I did not. Okay, three sets, three tiebreakers. Oh. This was awesome. This was awesome to watch. Like Hercotch has been in all these tight matches lately. I feel like just the other week I said he and Kokonakis were my match of the week, but. Mm. This guy gets it done. Um, he actually double faulted on match point in the second set. So I feel like to come back from that and ultimately win the match is huge. And it says a lot about his mental state and his mental toughness. Yeah, it's always rough when you look, when they uh, pull up that graphic on uh, a match you're watching and it says like time since first match point, like one oh, hour and 15 yeah. minutes. Oh. My and you're God. like, this guy must have been struggling for that time. Yeah. Especially on a double fault because that's one of those things where you get so in your own head if you double mm -hmm. fault. No, I know. And credit to Jer too because after a first set tiebreaker, it's kind of hard to keep your head in the in the match and ultimately like close it out because you're gassed after a first set tiebreaker. You're like, you're so close to winning but then can't do it. So a lot of guys get crushed. Like we said before, you know, you'll see a first set tiebreaker and then a second set 6-0, 6-1, something where they just kind of gave up after that and they couldn't even play a third set if they wanted. But um, in yeah, that match, what were you yeah, going to say? Yeah, because you, you, you look at it and it, it doesn't matter that it was 6-6 six, six and then 7-6. Mm -hmm. All that matters in the score, like you see it, 
when they do uh, the same thing with like the graphic, it it the seven six kind of disappears, and all of a sudden the graphic just says one yeah. zero. Yeah. And it's like, oh my god, that hour of effort I just put in, all the games I won, nothing. It just one zero for the other guy. Yep. So yeah, it, respect for battling back like that. Yeah. None. Tiebreakers aside, I thought it was pretty funny watching the the match because game in French is je. So the umpire was a je je. <laughs> After a je would win a game. That was pretty funny. I got I got a good kick out of that. All yeah. right. Who was your match of the week? My match of the week was uh, match of the week was uh, Vavrinka versus Greekspor. And it was an exciting matchup. I mean, Vavrinka was down. He lost the first set 5 or 5-7. Five, and then at 2-2 two, two in the second set, Greekspor was up uh 15-30 and he lost this critical point and all of a sudden Stan came back, won that game, and then at 2-3, he double-faulted and lost that game. And I think that really swayed him and messed it with his mindset. Kind of like I was talking about with her catch. The fact that he was able to bounce back from that double-fault mm-hmm. is really impressive because I think the double-fault for uh, Greek Spore really rattled him. Oof. And so I think that just the second set just escaped him at that point. And in the third set, it was actually a battle. Like... I think after that second set, Greekspor kind of calmed down, was able to get back in the match, but Vavrinka got it done in that third set. Mm-hmm. No, I love I love a stand the man victory. I'll yeah. always take that. Yeah, and the thing about it was, I think it's fun to watch Vavrinka because he goes for aggressive shots. Mm-hmm. Like you see him always trying to hit those lines, mm-hmm. and it was very unlike. I was watching uh, another match, Team versus Gasquet. And they had very slow, sort of methodical points. They were all just sitting behind the baseline, just slowly trying to drag the other guy a little bit further off the court. Versus Vavrinka, who goes for like that hard shot to the line on like the second or third shot. So, do you think that could be because he's older and he can't stay in points longer? I think that's an element to it. I mean, obviously, you look at his build. He doesn't look like yeah. a guy that's gonna be running around the entire court. I mean, he can do it, which is super impressive. Yeah. But he doesn't. He isn't built like a guy that's going to be running to every single ball. No, he looks like a frat star who can chug beer in the basement. <laughs> exactly. And play tennis. But yeah. uh, no, speaking of team, I loved watching him play. Watching I mean, him see, like, get back in there. Good to see him win. Yeah, it is great to see him win. Yeah. All right. Well, that concludes our episode. Um, let us know what you guys think. Will there be an American to win a slam? Uh, shoot us a dm send us an email and we will catch you next week all right and that's the show if you're not already subscribed go ahead and hit that subscribe button you can find us on instagram tiktok youtube at painting lines podcast feel free to shoot us a dm or email us any questions or thoughts at painting lines podcast at gmail.com